544, as it says in the bulletin, to footsteps of Jesus. Footsteps of Jesus. Sweeping passion me. Following the footsteps of our Lord week before his death. Sir, like the psalmist said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. We have so many blessings. Help us to never uh, stop being thankful, Lord. Help us to always praise you and thank you for everything you've done for us. And Lord, we're here to worship you today. I pray that that would be accomplished in our hearts. We know that you want people to worship you, but you also lay some parameters down. We must worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I pray that we will do that today and magnify you in our hearts, adore you. And Lord, as we come to your word, may we, we come to it, uh, Lord, in great humility, knowing that uh, it has what we need. We just pray that you'll bless the word to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. 
Good to see each one of you here this morning, and I do want to welcome our visitors. I got to meet Jasmine this morning. Did you get a packet, Jasmine? To fill? Did she? Good. I'm glad you're here. Thank you, Frankie, for bringing Jasmine. And I met Tom and Carol Seisel. Good to have you folks with new, new um, residents of Sparta. Did you used to live in Hudsonville, Aaron? Okay. And uh, I know Pastor Mark and Kim lived there for a while back in the Long time ago, remember that, Pastor Mark? Yeah. Or it was it so long ago you don't remember that? <laughs> you say so. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding you. We're glad you folks are here. We sure are. Make them feel welcome. And uh, wow, I tell you, it's uh, just the difference in uh, venue makes a difference in weather, doesn't it? I have to say, it's a beautiful day here today, isn't it? I don't mind. It. it took a while for my vehicle to get the frost off of it this morning, uh, but still, just to know that it was going to be a sunny day. And I, when I got here and slammed my door, I heard gobbles. That was that got me all excited right there. Right across the way, I heard gobbles. So I went back out there and listened to them, and I, I think, man, God's creation is so wonderful, isn't it? It's amazing. But this is where it's happening in the God's house. You know, a lot of people are out having a good time today. Uh, we're having a good time here. Amen. 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 I want to remind you, I'll talk about it first instead of waiting. This is track week. What does that mean? A group of like-minded pastors have uh, covenanted with other pastors and said, hey, let's have a push to get the word out. We did that back in February. We didn't do so well. I didn't do so well. I, I'll admit I, uh, everything rises and falls on leadership. But I'm going to try to do better this week. This is just an intense week. Grab some tracks and take them out with you and pass them out. Keep track of how many you do and tell me next week so we can give a good accounting. I'm, tr I'm planning on doing that myself. Grab some tracks. We have plenty. If you don't see enough up there, open one of the cabinets. We have our church placard. It's a card you can hand out. It, it just shows our times of our service, has the plan of salvation on it. That's, if nothing else, pass that out. Um, so this is track week. It goes from today, which is Palm Sunday, until Easter, Resurrection Sunday. And so please join in with me on that. Make it something, uh, you might say, yeah, Pastor, that's embarrassing. Well, you know what? You might get 10 no's and one yes, but if that one person gets saved, man, they're going to thank you forever. Amen. Isn't that awesome? That's something to think about right there. Glad you're here this morning. Thanks, Mark. All right. You're singing well. Let's sing again. Let's turn to 373. Sing Jesus Never Fails. <clears throat>
to the chorus. But I don't know the main verses that well because I grew up, people would start into that chorus, Jesus Never Fails. And when you started playing that, I had to get my hymn book open because I didn't know it. A great song, though. Amen? Wonderful. Praise God, he never fails. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Well, there is choir practice tonight, and uh, that's at 4.30. Okay, 5.15, Pastor. You're, excuse me? 5.15 tonight. Okay. So that's corrected, 5.15. And uh, you know what we're starting? I didn't get it in the bulletin in time with all the travels, but we're starting First Thessalonians tonight. And I hope you'll come back for that. What a great book. You know, one of the main passages about the rapture is in First Thessalonians 4. There are some great thoughts in that passage. It's one of the bases, bases for why we believe that we will not have to go through the tribulation period. I'll explain that. As some of the verses are found in chapter 1 that help us to understand that. But I hope you'll come back as we study it verse by verse. And then Tuesday night, <clears throat> we'll be in Jeremiah 23. Mary's... Um, Time will be in Proverbs 26. What are you going to do after Proverbs? Because you're getting close to the end of it. I'm going to take a break for, for a while. Okay. All right. So that's Tuesday night, 630. And then, of course, youth group, Heroes of the Bible, going on Wednesday night. And uh, I know with uh, the Brachamas out of town, does that mean that fall on you, Heather, this coming Wednesday night? Yes. Okay. We'll be praying for you about that. <clears throat> Men's prayer meeting uh, Saturday at 8 p.m. Now, I see there's a spring ladies retreat at Camp Kobiak. Now, I'm not going to read every one of these. I want to just get some points here. Uh, but that's coming up on the 22nd. You need to see Michelle or her mother, who's not here today, Norma, uh, if you want to go to that. cost is $95. Now, on the 24th, two weeks from today, we have a deacons meeting. By the way, we need to have a deacons meeting today at 5 o'clock, okay? It's not going to be a long one. But we need to take care of a couple of matters. It's not our normal deacons meeting, but we need to have one today. On the 24th, the deacons meeting is in preparation for our quarterly business meeting, which is on Tuesday night, uh, April 26th. So keep that in mind. Mark it on your calendar. Uh, the time always throws people because we do everything around here. It seems to be at 630. Well, we don't. We have church on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. So see, we don't do everything at 630, but the midweek we do. Uh, but this is at 7 p.m., okay? Gives more time for people that work late to get to the business meeting. There's a, I'll let Pastor Mark speak to all of these matters concerning the teens, okay? But let's talk about the mother-daughter tea. The theme is in the garden. Um, Dorothy, how are things going for that? Uh, I think it's going well. <clears throat> Any man that would be willing to help set up tables and chairs, see Jason. I put him in charge. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> so, Either Wednesday night or Thursday night, just as long as we can get in Friday morning to decorate. All right. We'll make sure that that's done. Thank you. That's coming up on May 7th. They'll be here before we know it. And uh, I want to mention, too, on the, the weekend of um, Memorial Day weekend, Faith, Fort Faith has a work weekend. And that's two days, May 27th and 28th. Be sure to look at that. If you could come up and help, I know they would appreciate it very much. Um, <clears throat> We're going to do the next hymn scene here and host Maranatha. That's at the end of the month of May, and so keep that in mind. I'm going to throw in a couple of things for you. Um, you know that our missionary, uh, Brother Long, is coming on June 5th. That's in the evening service. Uh, man, I'm kind of throwing you a curve because I'm supposed to talk to you about people that come here before I just announce it. But this person was approved to come two years ago at COVID, and because of COVID, that got canceled. Brother Joe Marshall is going to be with us on June the 26th. That's in the evening service. He has a um, Bible verse sign ministry. Now, he's going to be at Brother Van Belsen's church that morning over on the other side of Sparta, and then he's going to be at our church in the evening service. And so I'm looking forward to meeting him. I've talked to him on the phone a few times but I'm looking forward to meeting him in person. He has a wonderful uh, ministry about verse, Bible verses on signs. And uh, you'll see it, some of them in yard signs. And so he has a great ministry there. He'll be with us on June the 26th. So that's the main thing I wanted to emphasize. You can look at the rest of these notes. Be sure to read about our missionaries, the Langs. You know, we have the Longs and the Langs, so it's easy to mix them up. Uh, the Langs are in Nigeria. They haven't been there that long. Uh, but it seems like God is doing great things 
through them in the country of Nigeria. Maybe if you'll come, we'll take our offer. One of the things that we got to do uh, down there, that Mary got to do, is uh, she took a video. If you want to look at it on Facebook, it's quite humorous. I wasn't there. I was helping Stephen do something. But Bo cooked breakfast. And uh, she, did some of you see that? How old is he? he Bo's uh, six, I think. No, six or seven. Anyway, um, he made this statement. He wants to be a chef in the Army. But he said, if anybody cusses, they can't eat. <laughs> and so <laughs> several people were saying that on there, there going to be a lot of hungry soldiers. Uh, <laughs> but that was really cute. And we were, his, uh, his grandma Shelly got him a special chef hat. And you, you got to see that. Go on Facebook to Mary and you'll see that. It's quite humorous. Lord, thank you for the joy of our time down there with family. Lord, we do pray for Stephen and Tanya, their desire uh, to adopt little Artem. And we don't know where he is, Lord. We pray you would protect him, protect his life. And I pray that that would work out eventually, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the giving of your people here at Camp Lake Baptist Church. They're faithful, but you are even more faithful to us, Lord. We thank you because we know your word says you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Bless this offering now we ask in Jesus' name. so loved the world. Well, that was beautiful. Thank you for that. I do want to highlight a couple things for the teens just to remind them. Tonight is the afterglow of this month, okay? Tonight, after the evening service, the afterglow just means a little bit of the work time from God's Word. And the, are we going to play some indoor volleyball tonight? And just goof around as you know, things teens like to do. Um, have some fun and have some time with the Word. So that's after the evening service tonight. That goes till, uh, till 8.30. Um, also, I want to 
mention the progressive dinner because that's the end of this month. Uh, uh, looking for hosts to host that. We've had three hosted, right? You still need the first one, appetizer, right? Appetizer. Someone's interested in hosting the teens for a progressive dinner, doing the appetizer, come see my wife about that. And that one I mentioned just because it comes so fast and it seems far away, but it comes fast. All the camps this summer. Um, <clears throat> June 27th is uh, Fort Faith's camp, so junior high, senior high camp. And then the end of July is Kobiak camp. If you're interested in any of those camps, kids, come see my wife. A lot of you have already got the brochures and stuff already, but if you didn't get a brochure or registration form, come see my wife. And I want to mention those of you, many in our church, often host kids for camp. If you're interested in doing that again this year, just let us know uh, because there, there are some needs this year already we know of. So some kids want to go to camp, but they can't afford it. So if you're interested in hosting them, just come see uh, my wife and she'll, uh, she'll know that and be able to set that up as well. Okay, so I think that's all I want to mention. There's a lot of things in the, in the calendar. You used to see the bulletin, a lot of things going on, and you can look at the rest of them. Okay, all right, very good. Well, it's time for our greeting hymn, we call it, because we're going to greet one another and then sing. But it's 493, all for Jesus, I believe. That's the number, right? All for Jesus, 493. Uh, let's all turn there if you want. Maybe you want to mark it with your bulletin and keep it, because we're not singing it right away. We'll sing one verse. But first, let's stand this morning, and we'd like to do this at Camp Lake. Just greet one another and make everyone feel welcome here at Camp Lake. We'll come back and sing 493.
right. She'll play through one more time. Let's find our seats. So she plays through one more time. says it's Lee, the LV, and uh, Lee does her special numbers now by way of recording. Lee's with us. She's in that pretty blue suit back there um, and sitting there in the second of the back row. She's backsliding this week. She was up here earlier this week. Last week she was up here. She's backsliding this week. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Lee plays the Hawaiian guitar, but she's unable to do it now. But fortunately, many of her songs were recorded, so once in a while we pull them out and play them for you. I love to have her participate in that way with special music. So she's going to play this way by recording, uh, playing her Hawaiian guitar, and she's going to play a song entitled, He Bought My Soul at Calvary. Oh. <laughs>
I would say a little bit about this because you can see Lee sitting by Judy back there. Anybody that's visiting, Lee, um, I just picture you up here, Lee, because I think about Luann playing the piano, her mom, Liz, playing the organ, and you joining them in these numbers. And it's such a beautiful picture and a wonderful memory. Yeah. Wonderful memory. Yeah. And I want to thank you for preserving those for us. I'll never forget, Mark, when you, uh, your boss gave us this piano. What a great gift. We hid and took a video of Luann that day. Uh, she came in, and she had no idea that, that had, the switch had happened. And I'll never forget her going up there, and she was starting to get ready to practice and everything, and started noticing things were different. And to see the look on her face, you know, that was precious. Yeah. But sure, Mr. You know, it's been two years now since Luann went home to be with the Lord. Wasn't that in April of the that COVID year of 2020? April that she, or May. Yeah, I can't remember the exact date, but... Uh, <laughs> That's hard to believe. It's gone by so fast. But thank you for preserving those, Lee. What a blessing. It's your work. Uh, and they are. Take you your Bibles this morning and turn to uh, Isaiah 53. <clears throat> now, two weeks ago, I, I spoke on the um, Psalm 22, A View from the Cross, if you remember that. And we made this point that that was written... That was David that was the uh, author. Of course, the Holy Spirit was the author. That was a thousand years before Christ. That, that, that blows my mind to realize that, that the scripture is so amazing and so awesome and so miraculous that God could pinpoint such detail ahead of time. And he does many times. He predicts people's names ahead of time. He talked about, uh, you know, Cyrus a couple 150 years before he was born in the Bible. And things like that. But that's amazing. Well, here, this passage in Isaiah 53, um, it was seven to 750 years before Christ. And he says things, you have to look for them and study them for yourself. But just mark my word, search it out. Don't, don't, don't just take my word. Be a Berean. But he says some things that aren't even found in the Gospels about Christ, which I find very interesting. But um, it's... it's a wonderful, wonderful passage that we're going to look at today. Some people have said, and when we were studying Isaiah ways back now, because we're in Jeremiah now on our midweek prayer service on Tuesday nights, but in that long time of studying Je Jeremiah, I mean Isaiah, and it was really a, a blessing to study such a book, uh, one of the things we learned was that it is the most quoted uh, book in the New Testament. And... Um, just a, it was a micro picture of the whole Bible, 66 ver chapters, uh, 66 books in the Bible. I won't go through all that again. But it was uh, one of the things that I found to be very amazing was the, um, the so-called intelligentsia. You know, the people who think they're smart said there were at least two Isaiahs, if not many of them. In other words, they could not accept that one man by God's leading and by God's inspiration wrote the whole book. They had to divide it up and they had to cut it up. And those are so-called higher critics. And that's interesting because I think one way to de debunk a claim like that when you come across, is just like let the Bible speak for itself. Look at what John says. Go over to John. Before we get into Isaiah for a minute, go over to John 12 and just, just listen to the Bible's testimony about this. Uh, so these guys were saying uh, they divided up into two or three groups. And so listen carefully to what the Bible says about that. I'm going to look at John 12. Um, and let's just pick it up. Let's see, because I want to save something for later. I'm going to save 37 and 38. Um, there are 38. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hath hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said, Isaiah, when he saw his glory and spake of him. Well, do you know what chapter that was when he said that he saw his glory? 
The one is referring to Isaiah 53 that we're going to look at today. You know what, what verse, what chapter it was where he said, I saw the Lord high and looked up in the year that King Uzziah, chapter 6. So here the Bible in the New Testament saying it's the same man. The Bible says it's the same man. The higher critics say, oh, there's multiple Isaiahs. And I just wanted to bring that to, to your attention. We don't doubt the authenticity of the authorship as being Isaiah. We don't doubt the authenticity of this being inspired by God. Amen? Right. It is, it is a, that's the way we look at it. It's wonderful. <clears throat> You know, there's a good rule of thumb that you ought to use. There's a, there's a passage. You might not think of it this way, but I want to offer you another way of looking, thinking of it. It's a passage found in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, where it says this. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. But I want to just use that first thing. Casting down imaginations. You know, we need to do that in our thought life. Where does sin come from? Every sin begins with a thought. But you know, you can use that same phrase in your own reference of all the things that are out there in the world. We need to cast down imaginations and things that are purported to be on par with the Bible. I don't care if it's uh, J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or... Uh, Rowling, the woman who wrote the Harry Potter series, or Walt Disney. A lot of imaginations going crazy in this world, isn't it? And the Bible is telling us, cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ. You see, man, in his uh, so-called wisdom, he tries to, uh, you know, Make him like he's got it under control. He understands everything. Folks, we have to come to the Bible in a very different attitude, okay? There is nothing like the Bible. Amen. It is incomparable. There is no writing. Somebody said, well, you have, you have Moses' law, but we have Hammurabi's code. There's no comparison, okay? Um, somebody would say, well, the Asclepius of the... A uh, snake on a pole, uh, that's what Moses copied. No, it's the other way around. When Moses put that brass serpent, he was obeying God because they had been wicked and God sent fiery serpents among them. And then all of a sudden, this thing starts appearing in other cultures in their mythology. And it's very prevalent today. You can't go anywhere without seeing either one or two snakes wrapped around a pole and having to do with medicine. Folks, God gave the original. God gave the original through Moses. He's the true. Everybody else are the um, copycats, if you will. All right? And so I want you to know that this is incomparable. The Bible says it has all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. Oh, isn't it outdated, Pastor? Isn't it outdated? Isn't it like old fogeyism? Yeah, a lot of people think that. But you'll find that it deals with every kind of sin that goes on in the world today. Every one of them, it deals with it. Everything you can imagine. It talks about it in one way or another. So we have a very special gift here, the Bible. And what are we doing with it? Well, we shouldn't be coming to it as critics. We shouldn't be coming to it and doubting it. We should be coming to it in humility. Amen? <clears throat> I want to... Uh, quote something before I pray. It said, uh, in the book that I have on Isaiah by Dr. Ironside, um, he said this, unbelief finds difficulties where faith bows with adoring reverence. I think that's the whole difference right there between the unbeliever and the Christian. Let's bow with adoring reverence as we open the message this morning. This is one of the greatest passages in all of the scripture that we're looking at this morning. Let's bow with adorable and humble reverence. Father, we thank you for giving us your word, Lord, and preserving it for us. Lord, forgive us for not holding in the high esteem that we ought to hold it in. Uh, there are various stages of uh, unbelief here today, Lord. Um, there are even some Christians who 
had enough faith from you because you're the author and the finisher of our faith. They had enough faith from you to get saved, but they haven't uh, uh, moved on and progressed in their faith to trust you about all things implicitly because we sang it this morning, Jesus never fails. Lord, we, we can trust you, but forgive us for not trusting you because of our unbelief. Lord, there's some that haven't crossed over into the realm of belief, of accepting Jesus as their personal Savior. Lord, of agreeing with you that he is God, that you are God in the flesh, that you suffered for our sins, and that you rose again from the grave, and that you ever lived to intercede for us, Lord. I just pray that you can do that, which I cannot. I cannot make anybody get saved, Lord. I cannot convince anybody. I can talk till I'm blue, blue in the face. I can't really do the convincing, but your word is quick and powerful. And I pray that you will use it to do the convincing and to draw that person to you that needs to be saved. Maybe persons, I don't know, the hearts. Lord, thank you for this wonderful book and for this specific, specific passage, how wonderful it is as well. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll go back over there to John in just a minute because I want to notice. Let's read the whole 12 verses then we'll come back, okay? Because I think that helps us to read it more than once anyway. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him smitten, smitten of God and afflicted. Get my words out right. <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now we have no problem attributing this prophetic passage to Jesus Christ and what happened to him on the cross at all. But if you were to talk to many Jews today, they would say this is collectively the suffering of the nation. And they go start talking about Tishbiav and start talking about all the suffering, the Holocaust and, and the pogroms and all the ways that the nation of Israel has suffered. But they are wrong. This is talking about Jesus Christ. This is talking about their Messiah that they've rejected up till now. And so we need to understand that. Sometimes uh, you, you might think, well, this would be the great thing to lead Jews to the Lord with. Believe me, Satan is working overtime to convince them that this is not talking about a man like it is. It is talking about Jesus. And so they come up with some answer like they do. But I wanted you to see some things here. First of all, let's talk about the rejection of Christ. Who hath believed our report? That's, it's interesting wording, but it's a little hard. I'm going to go back to John for a minute to show you something 
uh, that's really interesting in how the Bible is speaking about itself here. I read it, but I want to read it with more emphasis. This time, I want to back up to verse 37 and read 37 and 38. I'm in John 12. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Now, we know that also happened in the Old Testament, didn't it? <coughs> Remember 40 years of wandering, eating you know, angel food off the ground called manna, uh, walking around in clothes that never wore out? Boy, I would love that. I'd, walk, I'd love to walk around in shoes that never... By the way, Mary, we forgot to get these shoes replaced. I got a split happening in these shoes. You know, uh, I got to get a new pair of shoes. I've worn these for years. I can't complain about them. I got my money's worth out of them. But now I got to get some more. But they walked around in sandals that never wore out. They got to see the pillar of fire at night, the fill, pillar of fire. They saw that Red Sea standing on edge as they walked across and died dry ground. Now... Fast forward 1,440 years to Jesus Christ's day when he is doing all these miracles right before him. Some of these same people might have sat there eating some of that delicious fish. Boy, we had some fish while we were with Stephen. He made some fish the other night. I love Stephen's fish. I had some sea trout that he cooked up. Oh, is that good? I, I could just picture these people sitting on the side of that hill and they don't know where this fish is coming from, but the Lord's just making it. He's just creating it as the disciples are passing it out. What a miracle! And they get to eat the fish and the, the bread that's before them. What a wonderful miracle. Besides turning water into wine and uh, uh, healing the lame man and healing the blind man. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So now we look at this in 37. Uh, verse 30 says, Though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believe not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who's the arm of the Lord been revealed to? The Jews. Who has had every opportunity? Who has had the most benefit? The oracles of God, the blessings of God, the apple of his eye, as he called them, his chosen people. And yet many of them, some of them were swallowed by the earth, some of them were st stung by these vipers. Some of them died in the wilderness because of their own belief. And yet he had people right there in his midst, as we saw in chapter 12, who saw him do miracles, just would not believe. We're starting in Sunday school about the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. I'm just going to tell you a little something ahead of time just to make this clear. At the end of that conversation between the rich man and Abraham, who is in him, the paradise, which is in the, in the, was in the lower parts of the earth. The separation by a great gulf. But this rich man wants Lazarus to come and, and, and to help relieve him of his suffering. And uh, then he says to Abraham, he goes, send, send him to my brothers. Send him to my brothers. I don't want him to come to this place. And Moses, no, it's Abraham, excuse me. Abraham says he has Moses and the prophets. Let him hear them. They said, no, no, they, they will believe if you send somebody from the dead. And Abraham says something very telling. He says, they won't believe. Even if they have somebody come back from the dead, they won't believe. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe when somebody comes back from the dead. Well, what do we have today? We're about to celebrate Jesus' resurrection. And there are people today that still won't believe, no matter how much you've tried to prove or show them from the scriptures, that Jesus is alive. We're going to celebrate that next week. That's a wonderful... We can celebrate that every day, amen? amen. He's alive forevermore. They would not believe. The rejection of Christ. Let's go back to Isaiah 53 if you're not already there. <clears throat> Who hath believed that report? And to whom is there already? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness, but when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. John 1 says it this way. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Imagine going to your own. Huh? Imagine Ta April and Lincoln and me and Mary pulling up into Tanya's driveway, and she says, we decided we don't want you to come. After that, driving that far, we're coming anyway. Get out of the way. <laughs> but no, wouldn't that break your heart if somebody 
He came unto his own. His own received him not. Despised, rejected. The rejection of Christ. It's still going on, isn't it? Sadly, it might be going on in here today in somebody's heart. I don't know. For what reason? I mean, the best question ever asked in this church was asked by Dick Trexler right down here at his son's funeral. If you're not saved, why not? And that you are saved today. Let's just say that's the case. Why not? And you've come up with this reason and that reason. And, you know, there's, there's something that's keeping you from accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. When he, as you're going to see, carried the burden of your sin, he satisfied the Father. Why aren't you saved? Read this song. Somewhere, somewhere in the Old Testament, forget who wrote it. The uh, harvest has ended and the summer has passed and we are not saved. You ever saw that phrase, Pastor Martin? I don't remember where it is, but it's, it's just kind of shudders me how there's a certain set time when there's not going to be a chance anymore. You've got to realize that. While there's breath, there's hope. But still, people are rejecting Jesus today. I hope you're not one of them. Secondly, I want you to think about the appearance of Christ back up in verse 2. Now, it says he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. And that's a positive thing, that the difference between Christ and everybody that's ever come before him. I mean, Galilee, as far as a, uh, a spiritual place, was pretty dark. And yet, here is light. The light of the world comes into that place. Out of a root, out of a dry ground. A, a beautiful shoot. You ever seen those pictures of... Uh, some kind of bean or some kind of flower sprouting up, maybe fastly for, fast forwarded, and you see that thing struggling to come up out of the ground. And it's starkly different than the ground behind, around it. Dirt and brown, and this thing is green and white, and it's just going to make it. And it comes up out of there. He is at a, as a uh, tender plant and a root out of a dry ground. Our Lord... Praise God for how he grew up in and amongst so many sinners. And yet he grew up in and amongst them and was not affected by them in that regard. The Bible says he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, higher than the heavens. He was not a sinner, praise God. We'll prove that for some other passages in a minute. But the appearance of Christ is what I want to focus on here. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I remember the phrase growing up, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> well, this is God's word saying he hath no beauty. That means he didn't look like an Adonis or a, like some movie star, uh, some Tom Selleck or Rock Hudson with chiseled features. He didn't look like that. He probably was pretty obscure in those growing up years other than the whispering that went on and the backbiting that went on, as I'm sure there were people that were thinking bad thoughts about Mary who had this child out of wedlock. And of course, later they would dishonor Christ and say, we be not born of fornication. Remember the Pharisees saying that? And so he said, ye do dishonor me. So there's always that kind of stuff going on. But he didn't have the features as far as looks that would make him stand out in the sense of, uh, oh, there's a, boy, what a handsome young man. What a, what a chiseled, look at him. He was, he didn't rise up head and shoulders. Remember the person in the Old Testament that was head and shoulders above everyone else? He turned out to be uh, quite a, quite a mess spiritually. We're talking about Saul. So uh, there is no beauty. And remember what Proverbs 31 says when it's talking about a godly woman, and I think this also applies to a man's heart as well. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. God is always looking at the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God's on. That was what he said through Samuel to Saul. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. And here, Jesus no former comeliness. It wasn't 
he wasn't, uh, you know, a standout, beautiful, um, handsome, you could say, athlete that could run faster than anybody. He could run faster than a bullet if he wanted to. Uh, but that wasn't the issue. He didn't do that. He lived his life in obscurity, and later he was revealed to the world, and it just showed how mean and hateful they were, as we saw when he went back to the hometown. What did they do? They tried to push him off the cliff and kill him. So it says, he is despised and rejected of men. Imagine being despised. I mean, I'm not going to go into it, but you could think of somebody that you, you despise today. Sadly, Christians... We shouldn't. We should love our enemies even. But if I were to say, think of somebody you despise, every one of us could come up with somebody pretty quick and think about how your Lord allowed himself to go through that. The one who made everyone, who made everything, allowed him to come amongst him on his own and be rejected and despised. Despised. The appearance of Christ. Rejected, despised. I want you to see something else I think is very important. And you'll see it in the way that it's worded. Verse number, um, well, let's read, read the rest of three because there's another phrase there. He is despised and rejected or been a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So we didn't, as a nation, they didn't look upon him as anything special. And uh, sadly, what he did was very special. It says, surely he hath borne our griefs. You know the word born there with an E on it. It's the idea of carrying a burden, okay? Uh, somebody said, I'd rather be tried by 12 than born by six. You know what that means? I'd rather be alive than dead. In other words, be, be on trial by a jury than to be carried by pallbearers, born or carried. So it says, surely he hath borne our griefs. He put them all on himself and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Because there's a curse associated with hanging on the tree, the cross, like a tree, same thing. Every curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. There's a curse associated with people that didn't know what was going on walking through Jerusalem that day, look over at Golgotha's hill, and they see three crosses. In their mind, there's three criminals. They see three crosses. In their mind, there's three guilty people that got what they deserved. And they're, they're seeing three crosses. They do not know that the one in the middle is bearing the sins of the world. They don't know that. They esteemed him smitten of God and afflicted. You got what's coming to you. But we know he got what was coming to us. He took what we deserved. Notice how it goes on to say it again. He was wounded for our transgressions. Notice our griefs. Now our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Wow. His stripes. We don't think much of it because it would be too gruesome. And I'll try not to go that far, but I'll just say this. The uh, being scourged is one of the most uh, terrible forms of punishment a person can have. They used what was called a cat of nine tails, a three-pronged whip, if you will, that had bones and shards of glass and sharp things tied into it. And so when they went across somebody and hit them in the back to rip the flesh, Paul had been scourged, I think, three times, if not five. I forget what he said. But here the Lord went through that scourging. With his stripes, we are healed. 39 stripes. His back was like hamburger meat. Then they laid him on a cross. Not a smooth cross that we use for decoration, but a rough, used over and over and over again type of cross. Rough and splintery. And his back was laid on that before they drove those nails. Remember how we saw that in the passage two weeks ago, a thousand years before? It says, they pierced my hands and my feet. A, a very vivid description of the crucifixion before it was ever invented. So it says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him 
the iniquity of us all. He laid it all on him. Notice the Lord, capital L-O-R-D. That's Yahweh. That's Jehovah. That's the Father. He's put on the Son all of our iniquity, all of our sins. You see the word used in the multiple ways. Transgression, iniquity, several times it's used. Wow. Our griefs, our sorrows. So then he says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Now I'm going to save the next spot. Stop, uh, talk there a little bit later because I want to talk a little bit more. But the atonement, when we talk about atonement, you kind of go back to the Old Testament uh, law and how it was set up to where they would bring a lamb and that lamb uh, in, a, in a ceremonial way had transferred to it the sins of the person. And so then they would kill that lamb and sacrifice it and so forth. So forth. And yet, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. And you come to the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, and it says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. This is the only one that would matter. This is the only sacrifice that would matter. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute as, after we talk about this stuff. But the atonement. Have you ever heard of the word vicarious? Vicarious atonement. Our place. He took our place. He died for me. He died for you. Literally, he did that. He said, well, I don't understand that. I was born in 1957. That happened on uh, April 6, 32 AD, according to uh, one of the scholars. And uh, how could that happen? And him, no, don't forget, before Abraham was, I am. He, knew, uh, he knows all things, no matter how you slice time. And as he hung on that cross, he knew you before you were ever born. As he hung on that cross, he knew he was bearing your sin and mine. I don't know how. Same way he could name every star. The Bible says he's named every star. I don't see that's possible from a human standpoint. It's because he's God. Amen. So as God, not only can he name every star, he knows, as 1 John 2, 2 says, he died for the sins of the whole world. We don't believe in limited atonement here. That's not taught in the scriptures. 1 John 2, 2 says he died for the sins of the whole world. And in fact, it goes on to say in one of Peter's writings, he says about the false teacher, even denying the Lord that bought them. See, kind of like a final coffin in their spirit, nail in their spiritual coffin is that Jesus paid for their sins and they would not accept it. Even denying the Lord that bought them. So don't doubt it. He died for the sins of of the whole world. The atonement of Christ was sufficient for all. And I know they take that phrase further, but only efficient to the few. Okay, if you have to say that, but all I know is he died for the sins of the whole world. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. A lot more could, should be said about atonement. I'm not doing it justice, but to preach this whole passage, I must go on. 2 Corinthians, I mentioned 2 Corinthians 10, 5. I want to read 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, and a lot of times when we see the he's and the him's in a verse, we need to explain who they are. For he, that's God, the Father, hath made him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the, uh, the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. See, we're made righteous because of Jesus Christ's acts Amen. and his, what he did on the cross. We're made righteous when we trust God for that righteousness, when we have faith and believe God in, for what he did and ask the Lord to come into our life and save us. See, it's that simple. God's simple plan of salvation. Did you, Brother David, didn't you know the man that wrote that hymn, that uh, track? Ford Porter, I think is his name. Sure. You mentioned him. What a great track. We're talking about track week this week. That's been one of the greatly used tracks probably for the last 50, 60 years. God's simple plan of salvation. The reason I brought it up is because of that phrase. God's simple plan of salvation. Uh, you don't have to be baptized. You don't have to be a um, member of the church. 
You can't let you if you could prove to me that your good works outweigh your bad works, it wouldn't be enough for you to be saved anyway. You have to be saved by faith in the shed blood of Christ and put your faith in him. It's a simple plan of salvation, isn't it? Let's go on. Verses 3 through 9 describe his suffering. And I did mention some of that already, but let's go down to about uh, uh, verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Before he ever got on the cross, um, he went through great buffeting and beating. <clears throat> Chapter 52, the near the end says his visage, that meant how he looked, verse 14, was m so marred more than any man. He took a beating before they ever nailed him to that cross. And um, so his, his suffering was intense, more than we can even picture with our mind's eye. It says, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Now you say, wait a minute, I see him talking to Pilate, but you know who it's talking about? Herod. Herod wanted to see a, he, it's like a guy that goes to a carnival and wants to see the, um, uh, you know, the two-headed snake or something. He wanted to see some kind of special thing go on. And so, yeah, bring Jesus to me. I want to see him do a miracle. And he's probably sitting there with his popcorn. Come on, Jesus, do me something, show me something. He didn't say a word. Who knows what Herod said, but Jesus never uttered a word to him. I don't know what happened when their eyes met. Probably infuriated Herod before it was over with because he sent him back. I don't know if that's when they platted a crown of thorns on his head. Think about that kind of suffering of those thorns going in. His, and the time they took the reed and they hit him on the top of the head. Whatever, but Herod had his chance to see the Son of God. And all he wanted was a side show. He opened not his mouth. He did not say a word. His suffering. The Bible describes it throughout the Gospels, and we see it here, uh, that he suffered so much. The rejection was bad enough. But then to start suffering at the hands of wicked sinners. Whew. He was taken from prison and from judgment. There was a prison hall there. There was a place where they had arrested him and taken him to. And they made their judgment. It was a false trial. It was an illegal trial because it was done in the middle of the night. And so it was illegal, but that didn't matter to them. Uh, they could strain at gnats and swallow camels when it came to these things because uh, they had one purpose, and that was to get rid of Jesus. Got to get rid of him. <clears throat> I want to talk about the sacrifice of Christ. If you'll see that word in verse uh, 10, it says, and he made his grave with the wicked, verse 9, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. I said sacrifice, but that's what I'm talking about. An offering for sin. He says, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. We'll save that toward the end. The sacrifice of Christ. You see the word slaughter. Do you see that up there? Where was that word? I saw it, but now I can't find it. Verse 7, yeah. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. You know, these words are associated with death. Slaughter. When you see an animal that's being butchered, the animal has to be killed first. It's a slaughter that takes place. They slaughtered Jesus. Notice the word cut off in verse, I think it's verse 8. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. It reminds me of Daniel in chapter 9 where it talks about the 70 weeks of Daniel. But there's a phrase in there. can't remember the exact wording. I'll just go by memory. But it says, when Messiah the prince shall be cut off. Okay, that means his death. Yeah, the Gnostics tried to say he swooned. Other false teachers came up with their propositions that it's impossible for God to die. He couldn't have died. Yes, Jesus died. Amen. Don't ever forget that. We're talking about the gospel is the death, 
the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The reason God could die is because God became a man in the womb of Mary, was born of a virgin birth, holy, sinless, and yet God could die because the Father allowed him to do so. It was part of their plan. Slaughter, cut off. Notice it says, made his grave. You don't go climbing in a grave while you're alive if you have any sense. <laughs> he made his grave. A grave, a place where dead people are. You drove by one somewhere today. Maybe more than one. And when I go by those places many times, I just think, that person in that under that stone, somebody loved them. Somebody was married to them. They were a son or a daughter. Their life ended there in the ground. Where's their spirit? They're either in heaven or hell. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. Either in heaven or hell. When I think about Jesus' own sacrifice, his offering of himself, he makes his soul an offering for sin. Death is involved. There wasn't an easy way out. Even though he cried out in great agony, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Notice the Father didn't answer him in that prayer. You could say there's a prayer that Jesus prayed that didn't get answered, and that was it. Because in John 17, he prayed some wonderful prayers for you and I that do get answered and will continue to be answered. But the prayer about taking a shortcut, somehow getting by without having to die on the cross was not answered. And so he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The sacrifice of Christ proves that he died. A grave proves that he was buried. Where it says he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, proves that he rose again. So you have the death, the burial, and resurrection right here. I want you to see, I'm almost done, but I want you to see the satisfaction of the Father. You know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to us, but we're not God. Before the foundation of the world, the Bible says they hatched this plan. And not that terminology. I'm, I'm not making up new scripture. I'm just saying this was determined before the foundation of the world because they knew who would believe and who wouldn't. It was determined before the foundation of the world that they knew Satan would try to throw a monkey wrench in the works and introduce sin and cause all of the suffering that's happened in the world. And they knew they had a plan. That's why when little Isaac, helping his dad carry all of that stuff up there to Mount Moriah, said, Father, we've got... Uh, the, the wood and, and we've got the fire where's the lamb and Abraham's words are so wonderful God will provide himself the lamb and he did amen he provided himself but I see this in 10 and 11 it's just amazing to me it says yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him the other night we were trying to sit around and and my kids and grandkids know how nervous I get when somebody's screaming, okay? Um, if I'm down there with Tom's kids and they're getting too rowdy and they're jumping around and I'm afraid somebody, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, just a, I'm just a bundle of nerves. I'm like, be careful, stop, quit doing that, you know? And they're all laughing because they already said they're going to put it on my gravestone. Be careful. That's what they're going to put on my gravestone after I die. I don't want a gravestone. I want to be caught up by the upper taker rather than put in the ground by the undertaker. But I don't have any choice in that matter. It's up to God. Well, with the other night, I don't know what was going on. Stephen was tickling Bo or Silas. I don't know. But all I know is I heard the screaming of a kid. And we're supposed to be playing a game at the table. And it was my turn. And I did not know it. I'm sitting there. I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Why is somebody hurting? Why is somebody screaming? I can't stand it. And, you know, and Mary's like, calm down. It's all right. You don't have to worry about it. You know, I don't like to see my kids hurting. 
I don't want to see my children or my grandchildren in pain. How about you? Anybody like that? It bothers me. I remember as a teenager, my mom said, you need to calm down. I could not even enjoy this camping trip we went on in the northern Georgia because my brother was three years old and I felt he was going to run off the cliff. We had a steep cliff right by our campsite and he was running here and there. I wanted to go home. I wanted to pack it up and go home. I couldn't stand it. This kid's going to drown. He's going to fall off the cliff. I can't enjoy this. My mom told me, go somewhere. Get out of here. You're driving me crazy. <laughs> so I still have these traits. Well, all I'm saying is, I don't quite understand verse 10. Except that God loves us so much that he's willing to bruise his own son. Think about that. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. Wow. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Usually travail is associated with childbirth, isn't it? We live in a wonderful age, and I know it's been almost 40 years since our oldest was born. <laughs> I emphasize that. Almost 40 in October, October 9th. But I remember this little ticker tape. And when there was somewhat relief and, you know, I don't know how much water she could have, but we were, you know, the sweat off of her brow. And, and there, was a, there was no contraction going on at that moment. Still pain, but no contraction. But before the pain started, here was this little ticker tape, like a seismograph, started moving. I said, here it comes, Mary. Here comes another one. Breathe, breathe. <laughs> Shut up, you breathe. <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad. But that's how my memory is about it. But I want to tell you, it, it bothered me to see her hurting. It bothered me to see her in that pain. I knew a good thing was coming out of this, that we were going to have this baby. And later, the twins were born. And I, don't, I, was, eating a, I was eating a Whopper when Isaac was born. I don't remember the situation then. I was having a good time. But the pain, when you're watching your wife hurt in that pain. Pastor Mark, how did you deal with that? It's not fun, is it? No. So when I see the word travail, I'm thinking about labor pains are coming on. And uh, TJ, you just had some kidney stones, so you almost qualify, okay? <laughs> you almost qualify. I'm not saying you're a woman. I'm just saying your pain, your pain, I've had kidney stones. Your pain is there to where you can almost, I mean, the travail, you know what they're going through. We, we don't say that, guys. We know that. We don't know what the ladies are going through. But when I see travail, and I see that the father is looking at the son's travail and the pain and the agony, he, know he's, he knows that he's accomplishing what they have planned, and that is the taking away of our sins. Isn't that, isn't that marvelous? He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, those blood and bullets, they only pictured it. They didn't satisfy. Those lambs in the Old Testament, they didn't satisfy. Only one person's blood satisfied, and that's Jesus Christ. Only one event satisfied, and that's the cross. And it was in that darkness of the last three hours that Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why? Hast thou forsaken me? Is he let him go through it? He didn't rescue him. He didn't take him off the cross. He let him go through it all because he could see the travail of his soul and was satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Finally, I want you to see the victorious Christ. For therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Well, he's the strongest, of course. When it means the spoils of war, the spoils of, of victory, it is talking about having won the victory. And Satan was defeated on this day. He just didn't realize it, probably. He probably thought he was winning when Jesus gave up the ghost and bowed his head. And they had to take him down off that cross and put him in a grave. He probably thought he won, but he didn't. Jesus won. He was victorious. 
He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and, he made, and made intercession for transgressors. And he still does that, by the way, according to the book of Hebrews. Wow. He accomplished all that he came to do. Jesus. Isn't that satisfying to get done everything you came to do? I, I, don't, have that, I don't have that satisfaction very often. It seems like I don't finish jobs, but it's satisfying to finish a job. It was satisfying to get to our house last night. We made it. We're home. We're safe. God blessed and God answered prayer. By the way, thank you for those prayers. Think about Jesus. He can sit at the right hand of the Father and rest in his finished work because he came and he did all that he came to do so that you could be saved. What in the world are you going to say to him if you don't accept him? What are you going to say at the judgment called the great white throne judgment? Can you give me another chance? Mm -hmm. That's the time of no second chances. This is the age of grace. The window of opportunity is closing. If you're not saved, why not? Father, thank you for this marvelous passage. And to get a glimpse of the sufferings of our Savior. Speak to somebody's heart now. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. Turn to 308. It will be our invitation hymn.